What's up, YouTube? Ryan Penn here, least productive YouTuber in history. Hope you guys are doing reasonably well. Welcome back to Procrastination 101, also known as year-end list <laughs> two months into the new year. This is list three of four. So if you missed my worst albums list or my best metal albums list, be sure to check those out. As per usual, I'm separating the metal world from the, the rest of the industry. So this list will probably be the most fun, definitely the most varied. I'm super proud of, of this group of albums that I've ended up with here, which is actually a top 25. So be sure to watch to the end of this video for honorable mentions because there's, <laughs> I mean, we got everything. Rock, hip hop, R&B, EDM, country, dream pop, it's all there. So if you're gonna watch this video, it would be extremely helpful to do so while not being a closed-minded elitist prick <laughs> if you wanna get the most out of it because we're gonna cover a lot of ground. And first and foremost, before we even discuss any albums, thank you so much to all these artists for helping make 2018 such a fucking killer year and, and making my job extremely difficult, at least as it pertains to narrowing down what albums I want to discuss here, which it's a list that I've had for two months now, but still, it was a very involved process. So yeah, again, be sure to watch to the end of this video for all the honorable mentions, just so you can get a, a real survey of everything that I was heavily considering for this list, because there were a lot of options. With all that being said, let's kick this shit off. At number 10, a dance record that came out all the way back in January and really helped define the entire stretch of the year for me that was above and beyond with Common Ground. This record was actually my introduction to this British trance powerhouse, and since getting into this record, I've since gone back and become intimately acquainted with great records of theirs like Tri-State, which I love. This record, it really carried me through those depressing winter months and those long early morning commutes. And then I found that as summer came, I was just playing it more and more and more. And it's it's really one of those multi-purpose dance records. And, and what I mean by that is that whether it's a, a cold night drive or a sunny day drink, it kind of plays the same. It has the same effect. And the platter of tracks that's offered on this record is so nice and well-rounded, whether it's a bright, radiant, house-infused cut like My Own Hymn, which, spoiler alert, will be one of my songs of 2018 for the next video. Whether it's a cut like that, or it's a brooding ballad like Bittersweet and Blue, or it's a more sensual mid-tempo one like Sahara Love. And, and also the thing about this record is, it is it's very vocal heavy. So it's highly recommended for people who are not normally into dance music because it's got a lot of pop sensibility to it. So it's perfect to recommend to non-EDM fans because it's so instantly likable. And I was surprised that in December, after 12 months of having this record pretty much consistently in my rotation, that I, I hadn't tired of it. But that's a true test of a good record when it can withstand all four seasons and you still like it just as much at the end of the year. Coming in at number nine, a critical darling in the hip hop world this past year, Saba's Care For Me. Saba's a young dude out of Chicago. I think this record dropped right before he turned 24, but he makes music with the hard earned wisdom and wistful nostalgia of an old soul. His storytelling in particular is just immaculate on, on highlights like Prom King and, and Fighter production, which is often jazz tinged on, on a, a cut like Calligraphy, which is one of my favorite songs, is just gorgeous. And the guy, what I love about this record is the guy keeps such a, a tight circle in terms of who made it and who he's collaborating with. So the result is, is a, a pretty insular record and a pretty focused record. And this is the kind of situation where because his storytelling and his narratives are so detailed, if he had diluted this record with a bunch of less talented collaborators, it would have taken away from the end product. That highly emotional introspection and clarity that comes through is only as the result of telling one man's story with, with a, a surrounding cast of people who understand his vision. And not only is this a phenomenal hip hop record, but I'm just really excited to see what this dude does next. Pick number eight, Janelle Monet with Dirty Computer. Another critic's choice as it were, but for good reason. Not only are the feminist and pro-black and sex positive overtones on this record more culturally relevant now than ever, but just the tunes are such a refreshing blend of R&B with like a little bit of hip hop on Jenko Jane, or maybe a little bit of funk on my favorite track, which is Screwed. And of course, there's also an obvious ode to the heyday of Prince with the closing track on here, Americans, which I love. It's just, for me at least, it's so rare for me to hear a, a mainstream R&B record that is able to cross-pollinate but not be completely overtaken by the 
kind of dominant influences of hip hop and pop. I feel like when I listen to a lot of big R&B records, you're basically listening to a pop record or a hip hop record with R&B singing or, or, or R&B production. But with this, I feel like Janelle Monae was able to dip her toes into a bunch of different pools, so to speak, but still keep it feeling like a fucking R&B record. Giving number seven to Miles Kennedy with his solo record, Year of the Tiger. Miles, one of the undisputed best rock vocalists of the modern day, probably of any day, <laughs> quite honestly, having come to prominence as the singer of both Alter Bridge and Slash the Solo Band. And look, we knew Miles' talent in the context of the rock world, but I've just been sitting here patiently, just waiting. Because I knew if he dropped a solo record, I just had this funny little feeling, this funny little feeling that if he were to stretch himself a little bit wider on a solo record, it could be arguably better than any of his other band's material. Because you give a guy with a voice like Miles Kennedy the creative freedom to branch out a little bit and God knows what could happen. And boy was I right. Uh, this record has very little to do with rock music, refreshingly, as it is mostly rooted in a little bit of folk, a little bit of blues, a little bit of country. And in that sense, this past year, it served as, as a real escapist record for me sonically because the sound of it is so rural and so country and so far from the noise of my day-to-day -day life. So listening to it from a sonic perspective took me away. And then the cherry on top here, which is what propels it really to this list, is just the incredible lyric writing, much of which actually centers on the loss of Miles' father when he was a young kid. And so between having that really weighty emotional content and, and also seeing Miles stretch so effortlessly into all these different genres that I always had a funny feeling that might work with his voice, it was one of the most rewarding things I experienced the entire year. And I'm sure a lot of Miles Kennedy fans feel similarly because there have been rumors of him dropping a solo album for close to a decade now. Okay, number six, Steve Angelo, Human. The former Swedish House Mafia member making a spirituality-themed dance music concept record. Going into this thing, the chances of me liking it felt like zero, like an actual zero. How the fuck is that supposed to work? And then I gave it a shot and everything I knew about myself and life and the world and the universe turned out to be wrong because I fell in love with it and it was such an incredibly rich listening experience. It's one of those records, and these records are getting rarer and rarer for me in the streaming era. It's one of those records that you really block out an hour plus of your time to get that front to back experience. And believe me, there are some standalone bangers on here like Flashing Lights, like Paradiso, like Freedom of Pusha T. And those songs definitely I abused on my individual playlist this year. But to hear a dance record that has really a, a front to back flow to it, it's pretty rare. I'm just so glad I gave this record a shot, man, because it really opened my mind to what is possible in the world of dance music with just the right execution and the right ambition. Next, our first entry into the top five, gotta give some love to Devin Dawson's Dark Horse, a country record that really wowed me right at the start of the year. If not for Devin's voice and hooks alone, then for his really, really impressive grasp of conceptual lyrics. The songs on this record tell very specific stories, paint very specific, vivid pictures, and I really appreciate the nuance and detail that goes into songwriting like that. Whether Dawson is addressing a topic like PDA in a love struck couple, or he's talking about a vindictive ex-lover using her sexuality as a weapon, that's the song War Paint, it's just really refreshing to hear a country record that has such focus lyrically, because this is a genre that, in my experience, spends a lot of time in pandering generalities. A dirt road, a cold beer, yada, yada, yada. Whereas someone like Devin Dawson is over here telling stories. And I, I think that the claim he's gotten so far is well-deserved. I can't wait to see where he takes his career and takes the genre for that matter. Numero cuatro, 
loved, loved this fucking Slash solo record, Living the Dream, which, by the way, is vocalist Miles Kennedy's second record to make this list. It's also my favorite Slash solo record to date, which is saying a lot given how much I loved 2012's Apocalyptic Love. That was like one of my favorite records of the whole year. But this is just a fucking clinic in straight ahead rock and roll, which aside from nostalgia acts or derivative acts like Rival Sons or, or Greta Van Fleet, Straight ahead rock and roll, it feels like a dying art form. I'm sorry, but it does. And to hear Slash and company keeping it alive and well, it's just the best feeling. And it's a record that sounds modern. It's a record that sounds energized. Do we still need some new blood in, in the rock and hard rock worlds? Yeah, we do. But if Slash and his band are gonna keep pumping out records like this, I'm good for a while. Getting our bronze medal here, Snack the Rippers Off the Rails, an independent, no frills hip hop record with rapping wise, just everything I look for. The bars, the flows, the content, the posturing, the beat selection, a couple dope collaborations with people like Ritz, for example. This record was actually my introduction to Snack the Ripper as an artist. And I am just so fucking impressed with his lyrical talent, with his heart, and with his perspective on life, just as a, as a veteran in the hip hop game now and as a new dad, he's just, on this record, he's a guy with a lot of ability and a lot to talk about. And when those two things meet, it just creates magic. And this was just a fucking outstanding hip hop record. Number two, another rap record, Royce the Five Nine with Book of Ryan. <laughs> You know, when, when Royce put out Layers in 2016, I was just like, all right, this has got to be the pinnacle of introspective, personal Royce, right? That, that's how it felt to me. Boy, was I so fucking wrong. This record is so vividly autobiographical and is just like, not even a rapper, but a human being spilling his guts out about his childhood and now his experiences as a father. The skits on here are actually productive and emotionally poignant, and I would never say that about fucking skits on a hip hop record. The rapidy rap moments, which there are a few kind of spurs into here, are fucking excellent, like Summer Unlocked, The Posse Cut, or Caterpillar, and they, they serve as a perfect break between stories of abuse and drugs and coming of age. It's just, this is why I love hip hop, man. It's when it allows itself to be, it is the most uniquely personal genre of music. And Royce exemplifies that better than anybody on here. And also just the fact that Royce fucking two decades into his career is still making like the best music he's ever made is also amazing and very inspiring. To me, longevity is like the best metric of success in music. I truly believe that. And when you, when you have longevity and you continue to improve, it's just amazing to watch. Like I can't wait for his next record now. And I thought that Layers was kind of gonna be the peak for me. And the number one record, which if I traveled back in time eight years and found out that I would be choosing something like this, I might have a stroke. Casey Musgraves with the incredible golden hour. Yep, a country record at number one. If I had one constant go-to album for 2018, it's Miss Casey. Haven't been a fan of hers at all before. I just dove into this on a limb and it was maybe the best decision I made all year, which either speaks to this record's appeal or speaks very poorly about all the other decisions I made all year. Every song on this record just speaks to me on a really deep emotional level. It's insane. Whether she's talking about falling in love on a song like Butterflies, she's talking about growing apart on Space Cowboy, or she's talking about interpersonal drama on a song like High Horse. Look, I, I don't know what went on in Casey Musgraves' personal life while making this record, but these songs just feel so fucking real. So real, like from her soul. And again, I don't know what happened in her personal life. And I don't know what would be more impressive if she had a boring life and imagined all this shit, or if she went through all this and channeled it into such an incredible record. I don't know what would impress me more. My favorite track on this record is Happy and Sad because it pulls off this unbelievable feat of articulating an emotion that I've never been able to articulate before. And it's that feeling of, in this case, in the context of a new romantic relationship, that feeling of things going so well in this moment that you're already nervous and saddened by the thought of them one day not being this way or one day ending. I just feel like anybody who has ever scaled to great emotional heights, whether it's 
career success or a super passionate love affair or a close bond with a family member can relate to that. It's just this feeling of, wow, this relationship or this job or this situation, whatever it is, feels so incredible and, and so magical that the thought of it ending ever is heartbreaking. It's that feeling of you're, you're happy that it's happening and you're already sad in anticipation of this lightning in a bottle feeling not lasting forever. I was like, wow, I've never heard that. I've experienced that, but I have never heard it articulated. And, and that's why not only does this song, but this album, it's gonna stay with me for years and years and years. And on a smaller scale, she's able to articulate feelings that I have felt in incredibly vivid ways. And that about does it. First off, time to roll honorable mentions, AKA the top 25. No phones inside the telly, pics inside the celly, baby, you know the house rules. Yeah, respect over a dollar, death before the signer, partner, you know the house rules. Uh, if I'm up, you can't be down and I'm down to tear shit up for you, homie, you know the house rules. Yeah, all bitches with flat stomachs, no cars under a hundred, my nigga, you know the house rules. I'm high, chillin' with Bruno. And as always, thanks so much for watching, guys. If you enjoyed this video and are not yet subscribed, please consider doing so by clicking right over here or just checking out any of the other content that I will be continuing to publish on a regular basis. Really appreciate you liking, commenting, disliking, engaging in any way with this video. Twitter, Instagram handles, at Ryan Panty Music, and I will see you guys soon.